Today on Wood Turning, we're going to be doing a different show, not a project. We're going to talk about things that I get emails about a lot because they're things we don't show because we're doing projects. So today, it's all about things you want to know. When you see the sparks coming over the edge of the tool like that, you know you've gotten to the edge and it's sharp. This thing is a dual filtration system, which is really neat. And it circulates the air in the shop and just stick it right in contact with the dirt and leave it for you know a month or so. Now bring this up and press and make contact. And you can actually see the shine is getting better. And that is where it's gonna crack because it's got the most pressure. So when it dries, it goes, uh -huh. Kind of like taking off a bad pair of shoes that really hurt your feet. <laughs> Wood Turning with Tim Yoder is sponsored by Easy Wood Tools. The Wood Turning System. It just gets easier. The Easy Chuck. The next step in wood turning. Visit easywoodtools.com. Rikon Power Tools. Tools designed by woodworkers. Woodworkers Emporium, your source for robust and Vic Bart lathes, Rikon tools, and easy wood tools. Thompson Lathe Tools. Welcome to a new level of professional wood turning tools. And Titebond has the widest choice of glues to help with whatever project you want to tackle. bug. <laughs> um, one thing we don't show you a lot of on wood turning is our wood and where we get it, how we acquire it. Uh, the thing is wood is a dynamic property. This is a tree, right? And so it literally has what would be the equivalent of straws going up the trunk and water goes and nutrients go up and down those straws. So when you start to, when you cut a piece of wood, it immediately starts losing moisture through the ends of the straws. It doesn't do it so much on the sides because the straw is still intact. So what does that mean? That means if you want to use wood from a tree, you need to cut it down and then you need to seal it. And this is some green wood sealer. It looks almost like Elmer's glue. You can buy this at a lot of uh, wood turning places, you know, online, or my club actually has a good deal where they buy a 50 gallon drum of this at a time. So it's a better bargain for us as a whole and we can each buy a gallon and the club makes a little bit at the same time. But it's so important that Imagine if this was just a round log right now and I was bringing this back and it's laying out in my yard. The first thing I want to do is seal the ends here. That's all it's exposed in. It's going to be this end of the wood and the other end because that's where the straw's openings are. Now, if you keep a log like that in the shade, it should work for a few months. It won't really crack. If you put it out in the sun, it's going to crack pretty fast no matter what you seal it with. The other thing is, is that I like to prep my wood a little bit further ahead than that. And you can see that I roughly cut this with a chainsaw to be like a bowl blank. And when you do that, you're going to have to seal these sides too because you've got angles still. But I, just for protection, I went ahead and sealed this. It might not look like it right now. But this piece of wood has been in a little shed I have for probably, I would say, two years. And so you can see there's no cracking. And Part of the problem is, is when you're cutting the wood, the pith, the very center of the wood, you can see the rings, they're bigger here and they get smaller as they go down. This has the most pressure. So when something dries, and that is where it's going to crack because it's got the most pressure. So when it dries, it goes, uh, kind of like taking off a bad pair of shoes that really hurt your feet. <laughs> anyway, so I'm talking green wood right now. And the thing is with green wood, then when you turn, if you want to wind up with something, say as nice as this box that has a fit like that, you need to turn this roughly, not to this diameter, but you need to turn it to like one tenth of its size. So this needs to be about three quarters of an inch thick when you turn it. Then you put it in a bag with some shavings or in a bag, however you work it, it's different for every area but you let that dry. 
and once it's dried, then you can turn it because if you turn it while it's wet, this fit will never happen. The wood's going to expand, contract, it possibly will split, or the lid will get stuck on there and you can never get it off. And I'll show you some examples of how that works out. Take a bowl, for instance. Here's one where I got a little greedy and I kept the pith in there, but you can see I have very little cracking because what I did is I turned it. This is about eight inches wide, so that's about three quarters of an inch thick. You know, you go 10 inches, make it an inch thick there. And I'll show you what I did down here. <laughs> is I simply took a paper bag and after turning, this is still wet wood, I put it in here and then I put the shavings in on top of it and I just rolled the top of the bag down. And why you do that is it slows down the moisture coming out of the wood. So again, there's different areas of the country have different humidity levels. Here in Oklahoma, this works for me. It might not work for you. But if you take your time, you get some beautiful blanks. But let me show you a blank that had an issue. This one dried too quickly. So sometimes you're not successful. So you'll get a crack. And that's just life. But the other thing is, is let me find what looks right to show you. This one, you can see how the rim is kind of up and down a little bit. That's because the wood dries unevenly. And so by drying unevenly, the bowl is going to move some. So that shows you how that shrinkage is affecting the wood. Now, can I never turn a bowl from start to finish? Yes, you can. One way to do it is you turn it thinly. You turn it to a very thin finished diameter right off the bat. It should not crack. If it does, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes it will. But you can actually see, now this has the bark in there. So this was sitting in the tree literally like this. And so this is coming around the tree like so. The bark even stayed on this. It's kind of a neat bowl. I have never put a finish on it. <laughs> the other thing you can do though, if you want to turn something wet and turn it to a finish, is to do a hollow vessel. Now don't judge me on these two pieces. They're some of the first pieces I ever turned. Uh, the shapes are a little bit unique. But you can see I turned these to a thin diameter all the way down and I brought the rim to the inside. It's not as wide as the side as the wood. And this one right here is an even better example because if you do this with hollow vessels, you can turn them green all the way and then put them in a bag, just let them dry slow till they dry and then you can put a finish on them. You can even see here, I got a little greedy and being new, I didn't realize the pith should have been where the hole is. And you can see I got a little bit of crack in there. So that's why you have to watch out for that pith. So anyway, that covers green wood, right? Okay, well say I got the cash and I go to the store and I want to plop down some money on some wood odds are you're going to buy a piece of wood and it's going to have a wax finish on it. Well, the thing with that is, is they're telling you probably, unless it says it on it specifically, this is green wood still. It's still wet, just like the tree you cut down. So you have to store this. Now, I recommend that you actually scrape as much of the wax as you can off the sides, not the ends, leave that thick, and then lay it on a scale and weigh it. And oh boy, can you see how long I've had this? This is 52 ounces in 2001. <laughs> in 2003, it was down to 39 ounces, I think. Well, I'll tell you what, I got a scale right here. Let's turn it on and see where we are now in 2015. I hang on to my wood a long time, right? Look at that. That's two pounds, 6.9 ounces. So that's 32, that's 39, 40 ounces. So, I mean, look, it, it hasn't lost any weight since 2003. It's basically the same weight. When it matches the weight for a month or so, then you can turn it. So that is one way of making sure your wood is ready to turn. Ugly, isn't it? <laughs> this is a piece of cedar that I've had out in the backyard for quite a while. And this is actually a fungal growth going on there and some mold and stuff. You can see how the wood's getting dark in there. If I had a big piece of wood, it would be easier to show you. But you can do some cool tricks with green wood. You can take like a log, ugh, as a log, and go to your garden area. And just stick it right in contact with the dirt and leave it for, you know, a month or so. Seal this end if you want to. That's a good idea. Or the idea is cut this log longer than you need it. So if there's cracks, you can cut them off. But anyway, by doing that, you get what we call spalting in the wood. And spalting creates these beautiful patterns right here. I mean, that's some incredible looking stuff once you get it finished. And that's what makes ugly wood beautiful is those different things like that. But anyway, so this branch I've had laying out in a cool area in my yard for quite a while. And let me try something here. 
because yeah, oh, that doesn't work. Let me move that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'll clear now. I'm gonna cut this and show you. It's been probably since well, I can't say about five months. It's got a couple little cracks in the end, right? Let's see if it fits under here. Okay, watch this. <laughs> Even though it has been sitting outside all the time, look inside here. There is no cracking in there. So you can take branches and small things like that and just store them off to the side. I'd seal them anyway. Why waste that much wood if you don't want to? And you can see the beautiful pink now that you get when you're using cedar. I really love that color. Um, that's another thing I'll talk about in a little bit about colors changing on wood. But if you take a look around my shop, as far as storage of wood, I keep the neat stuff, the expensive stuff that I've spent money on inside because you want to keep it in a controlled environment to where it's not being exposed directly to sunlight and rain and things like that. If you're going to store any wood outside, get yourself like a fireplace rack that you can put firewood in, put the wood in there, and then put a tarp on top of it, of it and now kind of keep it in good shape until you're ready to use it. I'm just kind of on a band for my wife. I'm bringing any more wood in, so I don't have anything outside right now. She wants to garden. Ow. <laughs> Sharpening is something I get asked more about than any other thing we do. But when we shoot our, show, yeah, when we shoot our shows, um, sharpening is one of those things that's just kind of like watching paint dry. So you really got to dedicate some time to it instead of just walking up and saying, hey, I did it. So I'm going to run you through my setup. This is a really high-end looking uh, old TV tray, back when they used to make those things for TVs that needed something like that. And it's got some cabinet drawers in there and I store stuff there and I keep some turning stuff into there, which is nice. But then I have my grinder and it's a low speed, eight inch bench grinder, which is pretty much the norm for everybody who turns. Uh, I have a 60 grit wheel on this side and I have on the other side, on the right hand side, is a 100 grit wheel. And the reason the two different grits is, is this one is good for shaping a tool. It takes off the metal pretty aggressively. And then this one over here just takes off a little bit of the metal. So this is where I do most of my touching up on my tools. I rarely use this except for my scrapers and I'll show you that in a minute. Now you can see I have a platform here. I also have another thing over here with an arm on it. Well this is all of a jig system. And so this is the Wolverine system by one way, and there's a couple other good ones out there, uh, Sharp Fast and things like that, and just use the one that you like. This one I've had, oh my gosh, uh, for 15 years minimum right now. And why do I use a jig? I mean, you see a lot of turners saying, you gotta learn to hand sharpen. Well, think about this. When you're turning wood, if you're within an eighth of an inch or something, generally that's great. You know, you're close enough, it looks good. Because people always ask, what's the measurement of that? Well, it's somewhere in there, <laughs> because it works. If the shape looks right, you're good. With a tool, this edge, look how thin that edge is right there. So, if I'm off a hundredth of an inch, a five hundredth of an inch, I'm going to dull that tool. So. If I'm a weekend warrior, and I'm kind of like you guys, I don't get out all that much, you know, because I have other things I have to do. And I come up here and I go by hand, right? Well, the odds, my muscle memory is not going to be quite good enough that I'm going to get that exactly where I want it on the grinder. They're not that good. That's why I use a jig, because the jig is my method of getting that tool on there in a repeatable fashion to where I can make that edge exactly the same way every time. It's really easy to put a good sharp edge on there, and two, I don't waste a lot of this expensive steel. This stuff isn't cheap and you want to make it last as long as possible. There are turners out there who demonstrate, honest to goodness, they get their tools for free and they don't care how much steel they waste, so they bam, 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 they hit it. I want you to hang on to this as long as you can because this is an investment. Now, this brings up another question. I'm going to show you how to do a bowl gouge first, right? Well, both of these jigs down here work for bowl gouges, but I use this one here. This is the uh, David Ellsworth jig. It puts a nice sweat belt grind on there. The reason I have this second one is it also does the sweat belt grind on spindle gouges, so I have this set for my spindle gouges all the time. I don't have to move any of the adjustments on it. I know it's where I need it. This thing is one solid piece, and it's always where I need it. I'm going to loosen that screw right there, and then that allows that to slide through. 
and then it clamps on it, right? Well then down here I have to set one more measurement. I put a soft aluminum bar there, just from a piece of shelving, and that I think is two inches, and that's one of the recommendations on how much distance you have to have coming out of this to use this system here. So, this thing slides back and forth, which is really cool. Now, the high-tech thing about all this is, I have a bevel here, right? I want to get rid of my bevel. I'm using a Sharpie pen. Again, my favorite tool in the shop. And why am I doing this? Because I'm going to put this up against the wheel, the grinding wheel, and I want to see where I'm grinding this edge away. If it's down here, it's, too, it's in the wrong position. If it's up on the tip, it's in the wrong position. I want to get a stripe all the way up and down. That also helps minimize how much tool steel I'm going to waste in this process. <sighs> so, this is where it gets a little fidgety, but I think you can see it. I have little black marks on here, and these do change over time, and I'm actually to the point where I need to sh sand them off and put new ones on there. But it allows me to quickly get an idea of which tool I need to put up here. And so I'm going to look at this, and that looks pretty close, but hear that? Okay, let's see where the scrape is. It's down on the base. So that tells me I need to unhook this and just barely, down here on this, just barely pull it out just a little bit more. Now lock it in. I'm going to bring this up here. I'm hearing the sound change, so I'm getting better. Look, perfect streak all the way across. So now I'm perfectly lined up to sharpen this. And if I can find, oh, there they are. Got to put on my safety glasses. So I'll get this tool done, and then I'll show you how to do a couple more tools. But as we go with this, we'll let the grinder get up to speed. You notice I have my shields here on the grinder, just in case something goes wrong, a piece of the wheel flies off, it gives you a little more protection. You would think you'd want to go right in on the tip, but that's the part that will turn away the fastest. So I actually like to come into the side, rub the wing, and get a slight curve on it, come back around, and keep a steady pace going as I do this. When you see the sparks coming over the edge of the tool like that, you know you've gotten to the edge and it's sharp. And it does not take much to do this because I made a joke about this being sharp in the beginning. No, it was actually dull as a comb. But now, if I take it up to my thumbnail, I can feel it dig in. And when it digs into me, that tells me that I've got it sharp enough. You'd think I'd have less thumbnail than that doing that so many years. Now, I have my spindle gouge with a sweatback grind, and this is the other. Uh, holder, the jig that I was telling you about. The neat thing about it is you can loosen this and change this angle to suit anything you need. That's why I just dedicated it to doing the sweatback grind on my spindle gadgets because I didn't want to keep changing it and mess it up and move it a little bit each time. Uh, one thing I tried in the beginning is I actually put an oil mark and made a scratch and some lines to go back to my bowl gouge setting. And I was just off enough each time. It just didn't feel like the right thing to do and I just wasted a lot of steel and you know me, I'm frugal. But anyway, let me get this going here, and it's almost the exact same way you do the bowl gouge. We're going to come in here to the side, make contact, and look for that spark coming over the tip. And you can see already I got rid of the Sharpie mark, and it's coming over the top, so we're doing good right there. So, anyway, that's how you sharpen using these jigs, and the way you sharpen the other tools is kind of interesting, and they're so much easier, to tell you the truth. But one thing in those questions I get is, what angle do you have your tool at? Well, there's kind of a universal one that I use for my bowl gouge, my roughing gouge, and my uh, spindle gouges, and that's 35 degrees. And I found this cool thing. It's called eye gauging. Got it on Amazon. But anyway, it, you turn it on, you got a little display there, and then as you open this up, you can see what angle you've got, right? Well, let me bring up my regular grind spindle gouge, and we're going to put this on here. Oops. A little wet, I was sharpening it a minute ago. Okay, now watch, I'll close this down to where it's on, on that bevel. And you can see we're coming in pretty close between 30 and 35 degrees. I like to actually, I might change that to about 35. I like to range between 35 and about 40 max. If you, the higher the number, the steeper that angle gets on the tool and the harder it is for me to use. If it gets too steep, you're just not cutting real well. You only do a special, a couple specialty tools like that. Anyway, let me show you how you grind this one. I'll use the cheap man's break, which is my dressing, <laughs> my dressing tool. 
And this has diamond impregnated in it. And so when you hold it up to here, you can see how clean the wheel looks now. It gets all the steel out of there that was all stuck in there. But I'm gonna go back over here to this side, loosen this up, and I'll show you just real quickly how you do this. I'll get it just close by eye. Okay, that's pretty good. This one just sits down here in the slot just like so. And all we're gonna do is just rotate it. And that's how you do a standard grind. If you're going to do a parting tool, you just bring the parting tool in like this, you just touch one side, flip it, touch the other side, so that's easy enough. Let's see, we just rotate it from tip to tip. What you want to make sure is that you just keep this nice round point. Let's let you see better. Keep that nice round point. You don't want it to be a, a point point. Yeah, round point is not a good term. You want it to be nice and round like that. You don't want it to be a point. That's how you do the spindle gouge. Now with a skew, you need a little bit of help because this is a compound angle. And basically this is like 21 degrees this way, 21 degrees that way. And to achieve that, you have to flip your tool. It didn't sound right, but you know what I mean. And you use this little add-on here that they sell with the system. So it lets you put the tool off to the side and then flip it and put it to this side. So I'll show you how we do that one real quick. And I like to have a fairly straight edge on mine. I don't like a real rounded one, but some people really do like that. So it's just up to you. But this is a real light touch when you're using a uh, skew. You don't want to dull that tip too much. And I already had that show you uh, black Sharpie on there, and it's already gone. So anyway, it's as simple as that. That's how you do a skew. That is really sharp. Now, I didn't mention, or maybe I did, I just want to make sure, a roughing gouge, you actually sharpen it just the way we do the standard grind on the spindle gouge and so it's no biggie but my favorite tool is this relief grind uh, scraper and basically it's two edges ground on here this one's about 70 degrees this one's probably at about 15 degrees up top I'll show you the 70 degree one because it's easier right now I always keep this platform in the same spot all the time so I can come over here and I can just come up very quickly and bring this tool up and sharpen the edge like so and so you get a nice clean edge on there and I'm not changing the angle at all and I get a burr on there very quickly so I can run from the lathe to the sharpener very quickly and keep reproducing this angle. I did forget to mention one thing about sharpening and that is <laughs> actually if you go carbide you'll never have to sharpen again in your life you just simply move this around four times and you replace it. And I've had this tip on here for at least a year. So it's not a bad way to go either because think how much time you spend sharpening if you really don't want to do it. Or if you have trouble with your hands and can't control the tool really well. When you're sharpening it, going carbide is an excellent way to go. And actually, I, you can see I have a variety of each. And to me, they each work beautifully in different areas. And so carbide saves my butt sometimes. And then sometimes I have to go with the regular tool steel because it does something a little bit different, a little bit better than I want. The next thing I want to talk about though is sanding, but not per se sanding. I want to talk about how you protect yourself from the breathing, the, from the breathing, from breathing the dust. That's my Pennsylvania Dutch coming out of me there. Anyway, the first line of defense you have when you are sanding is one to wear a mask and make sure you have one that is the highest filtration you can find. You won't, don't want those tiny particles of dust getting in your, in your lungs. This one's really cool. It's an N95, which is really high quality. It's made by 3M. I also like, it's really soft. You can see I've used it a few times. Um, that stuff came from my hands and handling. It didn't come through it, but it's soft and pliable. And the reason why is because it's hard to get anything that will go over beard and seal well. And this does a really nice job of sealing. Also, it's got this little vent on the front. Keeps me from getting really hot in the inside of it because it can warm up if you're in that a long time. But anyway, I don't know if Brian can get a good shot of it, but the second line of defense is to have a dust collector on your machines. I have this hooked up to my bandsaw and my drill press, and I can actually put a hose off of it onto the lathe if I have something really big and bad, and I can suck the stuff up right there. So. There is a third line of defense, but I got to go up to show it to you. I'm going to need a little help here from me <laughs> to shoot this because Brian's going to stay on the ground. Anyway, there's the ladder. Up we go. What I'm climbing to is my Rikon air filtration system. And this thing, it, oops, ow, don't step on the top step. I better go down one anyway, I can't see. So anyway, um, this thing is a dual filtration system, which is really neat. And it circulates the air in the shop nice and gently, but it does like 15, 20 times 
a minute or something like that. But anyway, you can see that filter is pretty clean on the back side, right, Brian? And on this side, it's pretty dirty because it's doing its job. But the, the, there is another aspect of this. Let me set that down there. If you look up in here, now we have a whole nother protection system in here. And these are almost HEPA quality. They will stop all the little bitty things that come through there. And so that gets the little micron sized particles of dust that can make you really ill out of the air. And if you look back in there, you can see how this thing works. There's a uh, little fan, a motor and stuff, and it sucks the air through. One cool thing about this is kind of funny, and Brian and I went through this. When we first got this, we had it hooked up, and this thing was aiming this way, like so. And I thought, okay, that'll work great. <laughs> Brian made a comment, we're doing some sand, and he says, I can't see. And all we did was have this giant dust cloud in the air, and we couldn't figure out why this didn't work. Well, this thing's a piece of junk. You know, I got to call him and say I don't like it. Now I got thinking about it. If you look straight across, there's stuff in the way. We have beams and everything in the way of the airflow. So it was just a simple fix of taking this and turning it sideways so the airflow then went this way. And it followed the curve of the walls and it did a beautiful job then of getting all the dust out of the air. Now one thing that we never really have a lot of time for, and we're actually running short again, <laughs> is finishing. And I usually just slop something on there so you can see the regular wood changed to the beautiful wood. But I could go through the 1700 different ways you can finish a project, but I'm going to show you two of my favorite ones. And they're both wipe-ons. This one's wipe-on polyurethane and this one's wipe-on Danish oil. The polyurethane will let me achieve a high gloss finish. The Danish oil soaks in, protects the wood, but it doesn't really do anything as far as gloss, so it makes it a nice subtle look. And I'll give you two examples. This one has poly. You can see the shine on it, right? This is old, so I need to buff it up again. We will in just a second. This is one we just completed the other day, and it's in the finishing process, but I put on the Danish oil, so it's not going to be shiny. But as I run my finger across here, the next step I want to do, I, I feel some roughness. And when you're putting on any coats of a finish, unless it's just straight oil, like mineral oil, you, don't ha you have to worry about this. You take, it's a sanding pad, and it's 3M stuff, and this is gray. They have white and green. They're different consistencies. They're rougher. But you just take this, and you just work the whole piece across until when you touch it, it's just buttery smooth. Then you take your air compressor, you blow all the dust off again, and you wipe on another coat. I could put on up to 5 to 10 coats on some projects, depending upon the look I want. But once I have uh, this done and polished down, it's the way I'm going to leave it. I'll put a wax on by hand. But if I'm doing a high gloss with polyurethane, the thing I like to do then is to put a real nice shine on it, is to come over here and let me see something real quick. Yep, got a pair right here. Uh, this is a Beal buffing system. Basically, it's an arbor with a Morse taper that goes through your headstock and there's a screw over here, trust me, and it pulls it tight on a bar so this won't fly off. It comes with three different buffing wheels. And the reason is, is it has three different things you can apply to knock the wood down. As in if the uh, gray stuff was actually helping me polish it down, you can use this red rouge, which is almost the same consistency. It will take the finish and, and buff it down and make it smooth. And then the next step would be use white diamond, and that's even more like a polish. Jewelers use this stuff to make gold rings and stuff really, really shiny. And then the last thing I want to do is I will turn this on. And I'll apply a, whoops, turned it on backwards. <laughs> Let's turn it on forwards, that would be nicer. Uh, I take some cornuba, and I'm just going to touch it to it. And you don't need much. Now I'm going to pick the speed way up because you want friction with this. And I'll bring this up and press and make contact. And you can actually see the shine is getting better. And by putting this last step on there, the wood is really going to pop. And if you're somebody who likes to sell things, you're going to find out very quickly shiny things sell fast. Well, anyway, that's an answer to some of those questions that I've been getting about things that we don't always cover a lot, and I hope it gave you a little bit of insight on how to do certain things. So anyway, until the next time on Wood Turning, keep turning. Wood Turning with Tim Yoder is sponsored by Easy Wood Tools, the wood turning system. 
visit easywoodtools.com. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Woodworkers Emporium, your source for robust and Vic Bark lathes, Rikon tools, and easy wood tools. Thompson Lathe Tools, welcome to a new level of professional wood turning tools. And Titebond has the widest choice of glues to help with whatever project you want to tackle. 